You know, I, I took the year off last year from doing clinics. I kind of wanted to take a step back and, and well, the plan was to take a step back and kind of sort some things out, but we ended up doing the world of question games too. So that was kind of fun. Um, so I didn't travel much last year. I'm about traveling this year. And what I've realized after like that judgment thing I was telling you about, yeah. what I've realized in the past when I travel, if I'm in an airport, if I'm walking through an airport or sitting in an airport and I'm people watching, I'm judging. <laughs> I'm not thinking the best thing about every person that's walking by, you know what I mean? And so what I had started doing was when I'm walking through the airport, when people walk the other way, I look them in the eye and I give them a little bit of an eye smile. They might not even look at you, but then I think, may you be happy in the next person? May you be happy? May you be happy? May you be happy? And what I found is you get to the other end of the airport and you have a completely different energy inside you than I used to have walking through an airport. So I realize now there's never nothing going on in here. It's either something negative or it's something positive. And if you don't, for me personally, if I don't choose the positive, you know, because I've probably people watch for so long, it's just, I do it without even thinking about it. If I don't choose the positive, I'll be judging again. You know what I mean? But if I can have that, may you be happy thing. And actually I've got a shorter version now. We just went to Morocco of all places, believe it or not. I just got back from uh, working with some horses in Morocco, but so Morocco is, you know, it's the top left-hand corner of Africa, but it's, just across from Europe and it's just next to the Middle East. So it's, it's, a, it's a complete mixture of Europe, Africa and the Middle East. Hmm. And so people there, you, I mean, they speak English too, but most people speak either Arabic or French. And the Arabic people, when they greet each other, they say, uh, Salam Alaikum, which is basically peace to you. It's not, hey, hey, you, you know, I love those old cultures because, you know, we say, hey, how are you? But we don't really mean, how are you? It's just, hey, how are you? But when they say, when those guys, they, they'll, they'll usually put their hand on their chest and they kind of look at you and they go, salam alaikum. Like, they say it with some, uh -huh. some, Sincerity, you know, what I mean, it's like peace to you. So that's shorter than maybe happy. So now my now my my airport saying is salam alaikum. It just comes out quicker. Uh -huh. Even the French there, you know, um, they all say bonjour, hello, and then ça va, which I think is is how are you. But they all all of them they go bonjour, ça va. They always touch their heart. That's so interesting. When they say "sava," and they all, they all mean it too. You know what I mean? Like there is no hair going kind of greeting. And if someone comes along to a group of people, they will walk around and shake and they sometimes do the two kiss things too, but they will, you'll be in a, someone will walk up, no one even introduces them, but they'll walk, you're in a group of people, someone will walk up and the new person walks up and he just goes around and shakes hands with everybody there before you don't have to introduce them to do that like they just it was it was very very cool i think because it's an older culture they're just a bit more or well, i don't know if they're more connected with each other or just less disconnected than we are one or the other but yeah i really like that whole the way they they greet each other i like that too that's interesting they say there's been a lot lost in the, just the english language it's a newer language and it's it, even just the meanings of the words are are lost. So it, it's it's interesting that you're talking about this because I've been I've been kind of learning about that and um, you know some like Italian and, and Latin and and how you can say one word and there's so much depth already implied in that word, and that's that's exactly what you're speaking to is there's there's that depth there that that you don't get with the, hey, how are you? Because it's just kind of superficial and people answer superficially too, right? I'm fine. Are they really fine? Or how, you know, how are they really feeling? And we can yeah. apply that to horses then too. Oh yeah, I started, you know, so when I went down there, I was asked to go down there by the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Horses in Morocco. And it's the, it's a, um, it's a government 
department. It actually comes under the Ministry of Agriculture, but it's a the government really wants the encouragement of horses, and so this big facility, and they mostly have bar, the barb breed there. Okay. Um, they have barbs and they have pure Arabians there, and it's a big st breeding facility. They have all these stallions, so I got to work with all these stallion, these purebred barb stallions, and some of them are supposed to be pushy and some of them are supposed to be uh, aggressive and, you know, all these sorts of things. And I just worked on, so they had a round pen there, so I just worked with all these horses, just getting them to connect. And initially you turn them loose and they just run around and look at the fence. But after a while they, you know, they come and connect and, you know, we videoed the whole thing. And I was watching someone video the other day and when I reach out and like they sniff them in the hand, I'd go, salam alaikum. Cool. <laughs> From there, here. There was something about, yeah. There's something about those horses though, like, I don't know if it's big, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but like when, when one of those, yeah, it's, it's crazy, but one of those barb stallions like looks you in the eye, they like look into your soul. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. And it was, it was, what, what's interesting, so I'm in this round pen, and across the road is a mosque, a mosque that's got a big tall minaret off of it. And five times a day, the call to prayer would go off. Oh, it, sure. was, it was very, very cool. A couple of times, some of the horses had laid down, were laying down when the call to prayer went off. That was pretty cool. I've got a couple of pictures of me squatting down here, and there's a horse laying down here, and in the background, here's this tall minaret of the mosque across the street. It was pretty cool. That's really cool. We went and we went, I've got to tell you this story. We went and saw a thing there. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So that in Morocco, they have this cultural thing called Tiburida. And it's a horse event. And it's based on old warfare practices. And what they do, they have a team of 15 in a row. And they're all dressed up in the, the full, whole Arabic garb. You know what I mean? And they're all carrying these big musket rifles. And what they do is they, in a line, they canter slow, then they canter fast, then they canter full gallop, and, and these guys stand up in the stirrups at a full gallop holding these big muskets and they swing them around and then boom, they shoot them all off at exactly the same time and then they come to a halt in a line. It's a, it's a, it's a part sport, part martial art, part cultural event. It's actually a UNESCO World Heritage listed cultural event. Wow. Um, and it comes from warfare practices. And so we were in the north of Morocco and they shoot the guns up because up there, enemies would be up on hills and things. Whereas in the south of Morocco, it's close to the part of the Sahara Desert. When they shoot their guns, they shoot it down in between the horses um, because their enemies were on the ground and not up above them. Wow. It was fascinating. But so this thing we went to, there was 1,100 stallions in one place at one time, like closely packed in together. Every one of them has like a finely embroidered saddle and saddle cloths with the silver and stuff in it and tassels hanging off it and the, the full decorative brow bands. And I mean, it was just, wow. I felt like I was on the scene of, well, not Ben Hur, that's Roman, but as, I felt like I was in a movie. But there's 1,100 stallions in one place at the same time. The energy was just crazy. It was, yeah, it was amazing. I bet. Mm. I, think, I think it's so cool that you've been able to travel the world and see some of these differences in not only, you know, how, how people express themselves culturally, but also to be able to see what they're doing with their horses because uh, it, it opens the door to more possibilities that would not have even, you know, just, just by language, you know, barriers not, you wouldn't even discover because you don't have the language to discover it. So being yeah. able to see it and be exposed to it is so, that's pretty special. That's pretty neat. It was very cool when I worked with those stallions there because they had an interpreter for me. So this guy has been an interpreter at the UN. Like, so he, you can talk to him and he can talk a different language in real time so you can just keep talking he just keeps spitting it out so it comes in one ear he processes in another language and, and spits it out and so he was he was very very helpful that's yeah and most people watching when, when english wasn't their first language or even they might not even know english and so sometimes he's talking french sometimes he's talking 
oh wow so he was doing like a lot of languages oh your videos yeah well, he, oh the video broke out and then but i see you now okay um yeah so he was sometimes it was french sometimes it was arabic he wasn't translating it into both but um oh got it got it got it but it was but it was pretty cool working with these these barb stallions with all the so all the trainers from trainers and breeders from around there were there watching yeah it was it was very very cool so tell us a little bit about your journey getting to where you are now because you started in australia if i'm not mistaken is that yeah. correct born in australia yep grew up on a 1200 acre sheep and wheat farm in australia okay then uh you know rode horses as a kid and um you know my father rodeoed in towards the end of the 60s they started importing quarter horses into australia and so he got to be around the quarter horses because of the time all the time events oh, the sure. rope and the steer wrestling and that sort of thing and so they were you know when we started riding we started on ponies and then by the time we got to horses we we're riding we had quarter horses and we showed at the quarter horse shows did all the you know little western event things okay and then what brought you to the united states uh, i wanted to learn I wanted to come over for a year just to learn about more about training horses, especially the reining horses. I want to learn how to train the reiners so I could go and train my own horses. And so initially it was just a year. I was here for a year and I was going to go home and not have come back again. And the trainer I was working for, when I, the day I left, we shook hands on his porch when I was going leaving and he said, uh, you know, if you want to come back, I'll give you a job. He said, you could do this for a living if you wanted to. And, you know, a country boy from Australia, I'd never even thought of that. Um, and so, and I'd met my wife, Robin, in the meantime, she, uh, she ran like a scalded cat. I chased her for a year and didn't catch her, but went back to Australia. And then I think when I went back to Australia, she kind of missed me chasing her around. So then the letters got a little nicer. <laughs> I, kind of had, I had kind of had two reasons to come back, the job offer and that. So then, so then you came back to the States and... And did you work at, at, for that fellow at first? Yeah, I went, back to work for him for, I went back to work for him for a couple of years and then we got married. And um, so then I went out, and went out on my own. Okay. And have you, have you always been in California or? Yep. yep, I've always been in, so we're in the San Francisco Bay area. So I've always been, you know, I was in the East Bay when I was first here and now we're in the South Bay. We're, in, we're down in the bottom end of Silicon Valley. Okay. What's, and it's interesting is uh, uh, this was all ranch land before, you know, old Spanish land grant stuff. And this town, when I first met Robin about 28, nine years ago, it was um, probably about 10,000 people, but now it's a satellite community, it's a bedroom community for Silicon Valley. So there's probably 40,000 people here now. But this, this county used to have more cows than, than um, people in it but this we're not very far from where the Dorinches were in Salinas but they've all been around, all worked around here Joe Walters worked on like I can see a ranch out my window here that Joe Walters worked on okay um, we used to have a picture of one of the bat like that backdrop you've got behind you we've got a backdrop for the horse expos and one of the pictures on them was a picture of my wife and I with those hills in the background and I was at a horse expo at, in Canada one time and Pat Prelly walked up the booth and he goes he looks at the hills and he goes, that's in Hollister. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I've worked on that ranch. <laughs> that's pretty neat to have all that history surrounding the area that you're in. Yeah. Some of the, the first rain cow horse competitions were actually at our local fairgrounds here back in the wow. 40s, I think, you know, this was all Spanish land grant stuff. And there were a lot of, a lot of like the carers around here at the, at some point in time. Sure. They, our local fair here, they have a figure eight roping. It's the only place in the world they have it. Yep. Anyone ever heard of figure eight roping? I have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they have a competition here and there's, there's you know, there's 20 year old guys around here who can do it. In other places, there's probably only really old guys who can do it, but they've kept the tradition going here. And so, so they, you know, they rope them and they, they, they rope around the horns and they figure eight and they catch their front feet. So you, when you do it, you get, I think you get five points for, catching everything one point for catching the horn on one front foot i think if i'm not correct maybe two and then zero if you only get the horns or you miss you just got over doing the world equestrian games 
how, can you can you tell us the story about that and the horses that went and yeah so um so we moved back to australia in 2006 between 2006 and 2010 we we're living in australia and while we we're there we helped organize australia's first reigning team for the world equestrian games and that was in lexington kentucky and we thought that would be a one-off like we'd never get to do that again and then last year they're going to have the world equestrian games they had the world equestrian games here in the us and so we thought we'd try for it again you know there was there's you know i hadn't been competing in the running for about four years my wife still had been uh and there's a lot of australians both who live here in the us and are in australia who are way better at the reining than either of us but it just turned out that they weren't going to be able to qualify as it because it, it's it's a it's a uh journey's not the word i'm looking for it's it's a big deal to get qualified I mean, it takes a lot of effort time money the whole thing and so i'd already decided i wasn't traveling doing clinics last year and so i had the opportunity to do that so we um we both qualified and made the team for that and then so the horses we took we owned both of them um one robin's horse was the oldest horse at weg he was the oldest running horse at weg and um mine i think was you know one of the one of the older ones there but they're probably the only two running horses at weg who weren't weren't clipped and and had bite marks on because they live in a past together i can see the two of them right outside our kitchen window here right now yeah um, and so sorry the dogs are whining and so yeah so they were um it, it was it was good to go and compete and and kind of show that you can have that relationship thing with a, com a competition horse you know what I mean? yeah. yeah i think that's hard for some trainers that are out there that are are trying to find that you know does it have to just be one way or the other does it have to be i just focus on the relationship piece and you know it, it can only be that or can it actually actually be both and i know that's an internal struggle i've had at times is um you know do you have to pick one or the other or can it just be something that can be that can be both and you've proved it can be it can be both yeah i mean i think you know with those two horses it was it was doable and you know it was uh yeah it was pretty amazing so we had we had um, help from Jane Pike with the, the mental side of the, the whole thing. And, um, you know, when we went there, our team coach or our chef to quip, as they call them, he said, so what do you think you guys can, can score on these two horses? You know, if everything works out. If you're good, they're good, they're prepared, right? Everything goes right in the day. And both Rob and I said, oh, we can probably, you know, two seventeen and a half, you know, which would be 72 and a half under all three judges. We thought we could do that and so then we went the first round i was a 217 robin was a 218 and they have the first round is the team competition so they award the team medals from that and then the top 15 of that go directly to the individual finals and then the next 20 so from 16 to 35 they go back to the semi-finals and the top five out of them go back to the back to the finals and you know we never even thought about making the semi-finals, which we did. I made the semi-finals in last place and Robin was like second last place. And uh, then we came back in and we bettered our scores by, so I was a 220 the second time around and Robin was a 220 and a half. And um, that was way better than we thought we could ever do. So they're our highest scores ever at the, on the biggest stage ever. And um, Robin was the, so Robin didn't make it back to the finals. She was in sixth place and I was in seventh. So we almost made it back to the finals on our little cheapy backyard horses here, you know. Um, but the big, the big part of it was you know, the mental coaching that Jane Pike had given us leading up to it. That was the, the thing. Like, I've never, been, I've never been that relaxed competing ever, leaving it a small show. It was just, everything was like, we were just in the zone, like, in the state of flow, like everything was crystal clear and yeah, it was, it was great. It was, it was a great experience. That's pretty cool that, that you were able to achieve that level mentally in a high pressure situation because well, that that's is, the thing is I, I, I showed better than I've ever shown before and I haven't shown for four years. 
Yeah. So it's not the physical thing that that you need. It's that it's that mental thing. And Jane, Jane, um, with her coaching during the year, one of the things she did, she did a, you know, a Zoom call like this, and she asked us some questions. And some of those questions sounded like they're about, you know, self-limiting beliefs, those sorts of things. But then she made this audio for us to listen to. Different one for me than for Robin. And you have to listen to it with um, stereo headphones. And it's about half an hour long. And when it starts out, the first 10 minutes is Jane talking in both ears. But after about 10 minutes, this Jane keeps talking and a different Jane starts over here. And so there's these two voices in your ears. And you can't listen to both of them at the same time. You can only listen to one. But apparently, I found out later that it's actually a hypnotism thing. And it gets into your subconscious. And so... When I competed the first time at the World Equestrian Games, it was different. Like something felt different that I've never felt before. And I wasn't sure what it was. And then when I competed the second time, I came out and was like, that was different. And then I realized what was different was that little crappy voice in the back of your head that says, you're not good enough. What are you doing here? Who do you think you are? You suck. Whatever. Wasn't there anymore. And that's the first time I actually realized it had been there. So it's been there all the time in the background playing so much that you don't, you're not even consciously aware of it. So I wasn't aware of it until it wasn't there. That's so interesting. She almost, she bypassed, maybe, I don't know if I'm getting this right, but it sounds like she bypassed your ability to listen to what she was saying and compute it logically and go put it through all your filters. And, yeah. and, and instead she just, basically implanted it right in your head. Yeah, well, that's the second, the other voice, you can only listen to one of them. And they're both saying the same type of stuff, but maybe using different words and different sentence structures or whatever. But whichever one you're listening to, the one you're not listening to is going into your subconscious. And it was, uh, yeah, Robin had the same experience. Like we were both completely in the zone. And that's, you know, that's probably going to be my last, my last reigning competition. You know, I really not that interested in competing in that these days but it was a it was amazing just having that experience of that was the world of question games yeah but just having that experience of of that state of flow that i've never felt before in a high pressure and i've never felt in any situation but it was a high pressure situation and yeah it was it was pretty it was pretty amazing but it, that really helped me with that whole you know i tell that story a lot to people because one of the other things that i done that year was that whole non-judgment thing you know that that counting judgmental thoughts and being aware of judgmental thoughts and then reframing those thoughts and so yeah, i think all of that was a was a part of it but but definitely jane's coaching was was a big part of it jane a lot of her coaching is for people who have fear around writing but she also does the the competition stuff too interesting yeah the fear thing around writing is such an important thing for people to be able to work on away from the horse and and deal with and that's that comes up so regularly for people and they often feel not only the fear of of the actual fear they're experiencing but the fear of even letting other people know that they're fearful you know it's the stigma that's attached to it and it's it's okay to be scared and people like her, I, I, I'd love to maybe get in touch with her and see if we could maybe get her in the next year because it sounds like she's got some... Oh, she's amazing, yeah. She's yeah, amazing. yeah, because I think that's such a huge, I mean, that's just such a huge piece of the, the puzzle for so, for all of us, I guess. I mean, we all have fears, let's face it. Right. Yeah, it's the, I think a lot of times people have trouble with their horses because they're afraid that... They don't want to admit they're afraid, so there's an ex there's some sort of an excuse there. They're blaming the horse, but he won't do this, he won't do that, and all the problems are coming from the fact that they're afraid, but won't admit they're afraid. And Jane talks a lot about. She says that whole fake it till you make it thing is crap, yeah. um, because it doesn't work with horses. So these days they use horses a lot for equine assisted therapy, those sorts of things. Um, you know corporate team building stuff like that and one of the things i think that horses are good for that stuff is because they're very good at detecting incongruent behavior you know when you're in a landscape and you're at a landscape don't line up and when you pretend you're not afraid but you're afraid i think it makes them 
react worse than if you just said, hey, I'm afraid, because there's that you don't have that, that incongruency. If you're worried on the inside and you tell them, you admit that you're worried on the outside, it's a completely different feeling than if you are fearful on the inside and you're trying to do your best to put on a brave face, because that just makes you a liar. And I think that makes them a little bit <laughs> turned about being around you. And, and I, and I don't know if this is true, but I've been using this story at clinics a lot lately. And I say, you know, I think the reason horses are very good at detecting incongruent behavior. If you've ever watched like a National Geographic thing and there's a herd of zebra and there's a lion walking past and he's walking past and he's thinking, I'm going to walk past and go to the water hole. Okay. What he's showing on the outside is showing on the inside. But if that lion said, I'm going to walk past, but really I'm thinking about trying to get one of these things, these zebras here, that whole energy would be completely different. And I think that's the thing they really have evolved to attune to is that incongruent behavior. I'm going to pretend I'm walking past, but really I'm trying to eat one of you guys. And I think that energy, they just, they can pick up on that really easy and it makes them uneasy. They don't, can't relax that way. And a lot of people have trouble, you know, most horse problems arise from anxiety. Those horses are not able to just, just be relaxed around people. And I think a lot of times the whole physiological and mental thing of what the person's doing, not what they're doing as in the movements they're making, anything, just the energy coming off them is a big part of that. Yeah, cool. I think so too. I think so too. This has been great, Warwick. You've got so much to share. So much, just super valuable information in this interview for people to just take one piece of it. And I love how earlier you said, you know, start, start maybe with meditating and only do two minutes. So it's not like we have to go in there and just like try to make all of these changes. If we can make one little change, you know, like your non-judgment thing, it was one little change. Mm -hmm. And then you notice what happens, you know, that, that awareness too, right? That you talked to. So you notice what happens with that one little, little piece. And then now you've got momentum in the right direction. So you can start to build on that. And you can, you know, add, like you said, if you're doing 20 minutes, do another 20. So if you're doing two minutes, do four. But that's, it, it's, it's so cool that, that we can find this and we can make these changes incrementally and enjoy the journey, enjoy the process as we're doing it so that it's something that, that permeates again into our being, right? Into our lives. And it makes us better people overall. And that's really for the horse fair. That's been my, my goal is I want, it, it all starts with us right? So if we can be better people, then our horses are better. And if we're better people, then the world is better. Exactly. Yeah. If, if we can continue to develop and spread this knowledge, and, and like you said earlier too, it's, you can't judge. So everybody's on a different part of their journey, and they're going to resonate with certain presenters more, more than others. And that's, that's going to work for them and their horse right then and there. That's good because it's starting them on a path. And at least if you take one foot forward onto a path, now you're going somewhere. And then more comes available to us, right? And we can start to, you know, as we grow and change and we find more meaning in certain things, it's going to take us on another path. And then our job is like you're doing, you're sharing it. So you're sharing it with people to help people grow on their journey and, and in, their, in their path without judging where they're at, because we're all at where we're at, just like our horses are because of our life experiences. And we're all just wanting to be better and survive better and, and, and be okay. And, and so I, I just, I can't thank you enough for sharing all of this because it's, it's so valuable. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm passionate about sharing it because it's once I discovered how valuable it was for me, it's like well, it's kind of valuable for everybody. Yeah. So, and I, I appreciate everybody for joining us today. Thank you for being here and, and spread the word, you know, help let, let other people know about the fair or about Warwick and about, 
how they can, just through learning and experimenting and non-judgment, try to find what works best for them and their horse. Maybe try to bring out that inner 10-year-old child, right? <laughs> that 10-year-old girl. That's the big part, but you know, I, I think to do that 10-year-old girl stuff, you have, to, you have to get rid of expectations and you have to get rid of judgments and you have to be present. You know, someone, once when I coined the term 10 year old girl training a couple of years ago, someone sent me a picture of their son and they said, doing some four year old boy training. And the horse was standing in the pen and the boy was off riding his bicycle around or whatever. And I said, no, nah, that's not really 10 year old girl training. 10 year old girl training is you are with your horse and you are right there. You can see every hair in his mane. You're not doing something else. That, I said that ten, the four year old boy was just riding his bike around and the horse happened to be near there, but he, he had no idea the horse was even alive sort of thing. I think the 10 year old girl training is just, you know, 10 year old girls just hang out with their horses and tell them all their deepest, darkest secrets. And yeah, they're just kind of really present and open with them. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. It's so, um, so pure. It's so pure. Yeah. 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 That's, you know, um, I met an old guy last year who was friends with Tom and Bill Lawrence. And I think this story was about Tom coming to visit him one day, but he's, he now, he now trains cutting horses, this guy. And, um, Tom, he hadn't seen Tom for a few years and Tom came to visit him and he pulled up out the front of the barn and came in the barn and they sat down to have a chat. So this, in this barn, there is a barn cat. It's a wild barn cat. It's black and white. And this guy said, I know it's black and white, but I have not ever seen it for long enough to tell you if it has a black patch on its left eye or a white patch on its right hip. You know, he just kind of flits from here to there like wild barn cats do. And he said, and we sat down and started talking and about half an hour later, that cat, flitted across the end of the barn aisle. I don't usually see him in the middle of the day, but that's fine. Then 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, he was sitting at the end of the barn aisle, which he said, it's the first time I've ever looked at him and laid eyes on him and seen he's got a black patch on his left eye. And then half an hour later, he was halfway down the barn aisle and they kept chatting and half an hour later, he was over rubbing his head on Tom's leg. And he said, Tom stayed for two days and this cat followed him around like a dog for two days. And then when Tom left, the cat went back to being feral. And he said he didn't look at it, touch it, beckon to it, say anything to it. There's just something about him that that cat, and I imagine every other animal, was attracted to. And it's, I think it's, it's figuring out what that thing is. Well, not, it's not necessarily figuring out what it is, because that's having expectations, but just allowing, you know what I mean? Letting that, letting that, that happen letting your yourself be in that space i think is the the key to the whole thing yeah knowing that that's available just like knowing knowing the the people um and i don't remember where it was but that we're out in the jungle knowing that that's available so now we can be allowing it in and and if you if you don't know it's available sometimes it's hard to allow it because we just don't even think it's a possibility right and I think, you know, I think these days I'm really into a lot of scientific stuff these days, quantum physics type stuff. But what's cool these days is, you know, we have things like functional MRIs, things like that. So they can map people's brains activity while things are in real time, while things are happening. And so they can almost quantify the spiritual sort of stuff. You know what I mean? And so you can actually see the science of, when your brain's thinking this, this happens to your body, they can detect energy in your body, your horse can detect that energy. And so, you know, you really get to um, be aware that your horse can sense, you know, your thoughts and your energy and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's no longer, oh, well, I'll just take a leap of faith and believe it. Now, it, you know, you, it's, it's quantifiable. Have you ever heard of the Heart Math Institute? I have, yeah. And so, yeah, so they're not actually very far from here, but that, that whole heart rate variability thing, that's popping up in everything these days. You know, the Navy SEALs work on heart rate variability. Huh? Um, there's a book, Stealing Fire, and the subtitle is how 
Silicon Valley, Navy SEALs and Rogue Entrepreneurs are Changing the Way We Live and Work. Fascinating book. It's written by a fellow named Stephen Cottis, who wrote a book called The Rise of Superman a few years ago. I don't know if you read that one. It was about achieving the flow state. Oh, but it, it talks, this book talks about a lot of things, but it talks quite a bit about that heart rate variability thing. And I was in the UK recently doing some clinics. And before I left the UK, I went to this one day seminar in London by these couple of guys who were like spiritual scientists. You know, they can prove the power of thoughts and all that sort of stuff. And they did an experiment where they said so there's 500 people there and they got this one girl up on stage and hooked up a heart rate variability monitor, you know, they clip it on your ear. And then we all did this heart, this heart math meditation, all 500 of us. And this girl got her heart rate coherence to hundred percent on stage in front of 500 people. And I think it might've been the, the community, you know, the, the vibe, there too but uh, yeah it was very very cool her heart rate was still 120 so she was still highly stressed about being in front of all those people but her heart rate variability was 100 percent, which means you're in a in a totally relaxed state so yeah it was pretty cool it is pretty cool yeah there's so much so much out there to play around with yeah let me show you a little gadget okay So this is called a Muse, it's a brain sensing headband. Oh, I've heard of these. You put it on like this over your ears and then it hooks to an app on your phone and you have earphones in there and you meditate with it. And the thing about meditating is you don't know if you're doing it right. So what this thing does is you can choose the sounds. I've got it on rainforest. And so if your mind is kind of scattered, you hear heavy rain. And if your mind gets quite clear, you hear really light rain on leaves. And then if you get really in a meditative state, birds chirp, like the sun's come out and birds are chirping. And um, it's good. I think it's, it's great because, you know, you don't know if your meditation practice is actually working on if you, am I getting it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. so that actually gives you feedback on, um, feedback on, on what's going on. And it's, yeah, it's stuff, things, so things like that these days, you know, like we have so much technology that's bad for us, like being addicted to the new phone. Yeah. But there's also a lot of technology like that that's really good for us because it can really help us tell if we're like, like that heart rate, you know, that heart rate variability yep. thing or the things like that muse. They can really tell us if we're on the right track and, you know, then you know what changes you need to make if you need to make some. Right. And then you're not interrupting your meditation wondering if you're meditating. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. When I first started using that thing, and I, it said, you know, if you hear birds, then you're in a really good place. So I'm listening to it, shh, heavy rain. I'm trying to get the heavy rain to go away, and the rain gets lighter. And then I hear some birds. I'm like, I got the birds. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be able to take the feedback of the birds telling you in the right place without actually judging <laughs> the fact that you're now in the right place. Right. <laughs> so, takes a little bit of work to ignore the, the birds, but <laughs> I had a girl at a horse expo recently come by the booth and saying, ah, oh, I've tried to, and she seemed like she was kind of an anxious type. She said, I've tried to meditate. And I just, I just, I just can't, I just can't meditate. And I said, well, how have you tried to meditate? She goes, well, I sit down and I try to be really relaxed. <laughs> no, that's not meditating. That's what will happen when you can meditate. Yeah. <laughs> she said, oh, I just, and I've had a lot of people say this, I, I just can't do it because I just can't stop my mind from wandering off. And I said, okay, there's the problem right there is, it's not about stopping your mind from wandering off. It's bringing it back when you notice it's wandered off. It's gonna wander off, you know. You're, you're, you're judging yourself too much saying, I can't do this, it's not working. And I said that everybody's mind wanders off. It's just your job to just bring it back. It's not supposed to stay there. I said, it's, it's like dressage. It's how many transitions you can do that's important. <laughs> not staying at the trot or staying at the walk. It's, it's, it's the transitions that's the big deal. And I said, it's the same thing with your meditation. A lot of people are like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So it's just their perception of their meditation practice more so than their meditation practice, you know what I mean? So it's, once again, it comes back to that judgment thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, is there anything you'd like to finish off with? Yes, I think there is. Because like this is a thing on its own. So 
in 600 BC, a Chinese philosopher named Lao Tzu said, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. And if you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you are peaceful, you're living in the present. And what I've found with horses is if you're having problems with them, they're either one or the other. 